Director of the I4 Energy Center, and uh, welcome everyone for, uh, to today's uh, seminar. I uh, also want to say uh, welcome to those that are viewing the seminar from, uh, from the Internet. Um, apologize, we, apparently it looks like we ran out of lunch, so the suggestions for use news you lose come earlier next time, I guess. Um, so today's speaker is uh, Dr. Ed Ahrens. He's a professor of the Graduate School at UC Berkeley. Uh, he's also the uh, director of both the Center for Environmental Design Research and the Center for the Built Environment. Um, Dr. Ahrens uh, received his Ph.D. in Architectural Science in 1972 from the University of Edinburgh in U.K. and also holds a B.A. in Arch Architectural History and Master's Degrees in Forestry and Urban Studies from Yale University. Uh, he started the uh, UC's uh, Building Science Laboratory here in Berkeley in 1980 after heading the architectural research section at the National Bureau of Standards. He has been a principal investigator for a large number of state, federal, and industry grants addressing building energy performance, indoor environmental quality criteria, uh, field monitoring procedures, and architectural aerodynamics. I had the pleasure of working with Ed on a project um, developing wireless sensor systems for building control and electricity demand responsiveness. So let's welcome Ed. Okay, can you hear me through the, the mechanism here? Good. <clears throat> okay. I thought I would first, um, knowing that you're an IT-heavy group here, um, I would uh, tell you a little bit about um, the Center for the Built Environment that we have and touch on s some of the um, uh, other projects that I won't have time to talk about today, um, which, all of which have some kind of tie-in with the folks on this side of campus and, and, and have had those ties in, in, in the past. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about CBE, our, the, the industry group, first, and then I was going to move on and um, talk about the things that are promised in the title slide. Uh, CBE is, a, uh, is an industry university group. You have a number of them here in engineering. Um, they, pay, they pay money to us, and we uh, get to do a certain amount of research every year based using that money. They also guide us. Um, in, in what uh, hot topics and what are good products that we need to uh, examine if they're questionable. Um, and very important to us, being over in the architectural side of the campus, is they have buildings, and we need to get into buildings in order to learn about how they work in the real world. And often that's not easy. Um, and we, um, because these are all, many of these people are designers and engineers of buildings, as well as building owners and, and um, big financial types, um, uh, they, they have access to buildings, which is uh, useful to us. Our research areas have two slides on this. Um, is, is this too bright for the slide projector? I, okay. Just kidding, it's okay? All right. Um, the, uh, there's going to be two slides of the, of, the, of the programs that we have. I thought I'd take a little bit of time with this in that um, we, we work on heating and ventilating and air conditioning systems, HVAC. And um, in that, um, we have been focusing on types of HVAC systems that are uh, asymmetrical or non-uniform, um, um, that, that are distributed in nature. Um, th this is different from the, 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 the current paradigm, which I'll mention, which is to have uniformly conditioned spaces. Nearly always uh, in, in large buildings, uh, the, the air is supplied from above. The space is uniformly mixed. The air is exhausted uh, in kind of a mixed state. Um, we've been very interested in systems that, that provide the air in some places that are localized, perhaps close to the occupants. You can see in this case, it's, there's a computer room floor that's been raised, and the air is actually being pumped through the floor just without ducts uh, and coming out of special registers, which then uh, flood the uh, occupied area on the other floor um, uh, with fresh air, and then that rises as uh, the various heat loads of the space, the occupants and the computers and things rise up um, and goes out the top uh, in the return uh, highly, you know, the more polluted air is up there and the uh, higher temperatures are up there, so you're exhausting 
the, uh, the least desirable um, temperatures. In commercial buildings, I should point out, uh, removing heat is nearly always the main problem. So uh, we got into studying underfloor air distribution for almost uh, 15 years, but our original impetus for doing it is when you have underfloor air, you can also bring air uh, out the furniture. You could, you could duct it up to the petitions or into the furniture, and you could put it right on the people. So you could be really distributed, even more than just flooding the, the lower zone and, and letting it rise. All right, so that's enough of that, because what, what I'll talk about later will touch on a lot of these things. Uh, we're interested in radiant systems, which is the cooling of the structural slab at the bottom of the picture. Um, and um, advanced integrated systems are underfloor with radiant, with something to do with the facades, perhaps, uh, with controls. There's a, a whole program on that now. Uh, we work on the Energy Plus model, which is a building simulation program centered up at, um, in the national laboratories, a, a big group at LBL. Uh, but we have a group, we're on the, on the development team for that. So, um, and then we move to the envelopes. So that's the interior of the building. We go to the envelopes. There's been a long-standing uh, group of studies on natural ventilation and what happens when you open the windows and uh, how do people perceive the the resulting environment inside. Mixed mode buildings are buildings that can, can have natural ventilation and um, have air conditioning. This building up, uh, in the office is be a mixed mode building. Um, and how to do them efficiently. Uh, there's a lot of controls issues there, a lot of IT and sensor issues. Um, uh, the facades, higher performing facades. Generally speaking, I'm not going to talk about facades today, but they're, they're a really black spot in the history of modern architecture is the way they've done facades and all over the place, including this campus, we've got good ones and we've got really bad ones. Um, and then how you measure the performance of them. Then we have indoor environmental quality at, at a more fundamental level um, than how the building solutions themselves. We have a longstanding program to survey occupants in real buildings. So we, it's, we do it over the web. We started it in two, the year 2000. It's pretty much the first such survey, and it's way the largest in the world. It's uh, I think 600 buildings, 665,000 people have taken the same core survey. So we have this vast amount of data on how people perceive buildings uh, that we can compare against each other. So for the first time, you're actually comparing building performance against a benchmark of of buildings in the population rather than some arbitrary um, uh, criteria which are based on maybe a lab test or some other kind of things. So the occupant survey is, is something that is thriving and moving uh, rapidly forward. There's going to be one in, there has been one in this building already. The, the satisfaction survey, some of you may have taken it. For those of you who are in the building, I've been asked to announce that we are now doing the second type of survey, which is a one to two minute survey that will appear um, one or two times a day for the next six weeks. So you take up to 15 of these short surveys which ask how you're perceiving it. And people are doing something with the building, I presume, while this is happening. But um, you, you are asked to volunteer to do this if you're in this building to, to uh, um, respond to the emails that will come to you, take the survey, and, um, and um, it, it won't be a, t a large amount of time in total, but it will really be helpful in knowing what's happening and how people perceive what's happening right now. At the end of the survey period, uh, the CBE will raffle off an iPad 2 uh, for the participants. Every survey you complete will count as an entry in the raffle for the iPad 2. Okay? This is, so, so there's a link here. I think it's already come to you by email. Uh, just to remind you, that's, so that's the kind of thing we do do. We, we've uh, done the Yahoo headquarters and some Google headquarters, and it, it, these are, it, people really want these iPads. Um, <laughs> the, um, advanced, um, we have an advanced thermal comfort model, which I'll kind of talk about the guts of in, in my talk, actually. Acoustics. Um, then we get there's a whole bunch of things on controls and information technology. Gaiman mentioned this demand response um, project that, that started back in 1998, the XYZ on a chip project with the Wireless Research Center here. This has been a wonderful thing for us to get involved in, in wireless because sensing is one of the big problems in buildings. There's not enough of it. 
There will be a talk um, on wire. Um, we, we do wireless sensing, and um, uh, uh, wireless sensing is kind of shown here by Tom Webster with our stratification cart, something you pull a string and it shoots sensors up to the ceiling and you get a, a profile of the temperatures in, in sy systems that are intended to be stratified. Um, and also it has wireless connections for measuring temperatures all over the, the building floor plate. Uh, very useful device for commissioning buildings. When you go into a building initially, when they, they start it up, they don't actually, they have a really hard time figuring out if it works the way it's supposed to. And if you can take measurements of simultaneous measurements uh, across the floor plate at the same time and up into space, uh, up into the uh, top of the space, you, um, you can solve the problem. You can determine if the building is commissioned properly almost immediately. So it's a very useful tool. Um, also, with the wireless, uh, we um, spun off, or we, one of our people uh, developed a, um, a wireless uh, lighting control company, which will be talking to your group later on in the semester. That's um, Charlie Heisinger. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and what's it called? It's um, already forgotten the name. Adura. Adura, right, yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. So, um, so that's been wonderful because lighting is a, the other big chunk, which I won't talk about today, uh, of energy use in buildings, uh, especially commercial buildings. And, um, and being able to turn them off when people don't need them or, or dim them and so forth is, is a, um, a really important, uh, uh, has, has large potential for energy saving. Uh, there's dashboard types of things, uh, uh, visualization, uh, either on small units. This is something Therese developed as part of the DR project, um, uh, but also on, on other, other media. And then finally, um, we're very focused on ASHRAE standards, um, the standards that determine uh, you know, what the criteria for uh, indoor environmental uh, conditions. And all the engineers have to adhere to ASHRAE standards. And if ASHRAE standards have been set to be too uh, confining, then they will not take any uh, risks to do new technologies or to try new things of the sort that I'm going to tell you about today. So that, that applies to. Um, to several things. We, we've put into the ASHRAE standard, Gail Brager, one of my colleagues, wrote up something, developed a thing called the adaptive comfort model, which applies to buildings with operable windows um, th that are kind of naturally ventilated buildings. There's a broader comfort zone for people in such buildings. We've, uh, it's, it's proven empirically. The reasons for it are under active investigation, though some of them are pretty clear. Um, there's air movement standards, which in the last two years have been in, brought in there too, which I'll talk about a bit more. And ASHRAE is trying to develop standardized performance measurement protocols for indoor environmental quality buildings. All, all, the, all the factors, that, uh, not, not only thermal, but also lighting and acoustics and uh, air quality. Uh, they want to have a standard set of procedures for measuring uh, at different uh, costs. And so we're active in that project. So those are all the things that are going on. There's a lot of uh, opportunities um, to in, insert uh, sensing and uh, IT into the, the type of information that's needed to do these things. So I've, I've kind of already hinted that I didn't like facades. Um, the, the HVAC current state of practice is also pretty bad. They, they focus on the zone, the control zone that's conditioned by a, um, uh, some kind of a diffuser or box, um, and um, there's a thermostat in a zone, or perhaps one per two zones. And it's a, it's a big volume, and uh, it's, as I said, it's uniformly conditioned um, and kept at a steady state. Uh, there's not much sensing. There's one thermostat for many people. Um, there's not any opportunity for occupant feedback to the building except complaints to this poor guy who sits in the basement um, who really doesn't know how the building works. Um, because there's no user's manual and the, it was never explained to him and he didn't go to college. And, you know, it's, it is a standard. Um, so there isn't much useful. There'll be a complaint and the guy will try to jury rig the building to fix it and the building will then for the next 30 years be in this state that he set it in, um, usually an override state, and the whole thing becomes non-functional. And I think those of you who've been working have begun to, in buildings, have begun to notice the type of thing. There's another amazing thing um, buildings are um, now being colder in the summer in America than in the winter. 
They're overheating them and overcooling them, and people are uncomfortable, appropriately uncomfortable in both seasons, and they're all even unhealthy in both seasons. This is an LBL study. Um, and, but we've seen it as well. Um, it's going on. There's a variety of reasons for it, uh, which I won't go into here today. But it's interesting. It's, a lot of it has to do with lack of information about what's happening in the building. Um, as a result of not having information in the building, you, you, you waste a lot of energy. The buildings are probably using twice as much energy as they need to do the equivalent job, maybe three times or four times as much. And you can do comparisons with other countries, and you'll see that they use a lot less energy. Um, at best, though, they only satisfy 80% of their occupants, and that's what ASHRAE's, uh, that's its standard for uh, indoor quality. So if they have a comfort standard like this, um, this is the comfort zone. Uh, this is a, a psychrometric chart with temperature going this way and, and humidity going upward. This is a zone that's supposed to be comfortable. There are two zones, one's summer and one's winter. Like this is with one clo on, and this is 0.5 clo. I'm wearing 0.6 clo here. Um, this is short sleeves. This would be a suit. Um, the, um, uh, so the winter zone, this is where people in America condition their buildings. And once you go in the building and measure the buildings, they're, they're actually, because of all the zones they've overridden, the, the zone looks kind of like this. They're tightly controlling the interiors in a, in a, in a winter uh, condition um, uh, all year round. And it's, um, anyway, it's a, uh, a fact that needs to be <laughs> dealt with at some point. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the conditions, and then we'll talk about why we want to focus on certain environmental elements. Basically, HVAC takes care of temperature, air temperature and humidity. I mean, that's what you get out of the, the, the outlet of an air, air conditioning system. Um, in addition to that, you, you exchange um, about half the radiation exchange that you have is, is exchanged by long wave radiation to surfaces. Um, and those surfaces. Um, if there are different temperatures from the air, then they will you know, cause you to be cooler than the air would suggest or warmer. Um, they, to, to factor those things together, there's a thing called operative temperature, which is actually the axis of that uh, ASHRAE chart there, which basically includes the, the average surface temperatures of all the surroundings uh, along with the air temperature. There's a new interest in, in radiant um, in buildings, though. So the, the people are beginning to think, well, let's Let's put radiantly cooled ceilings in commercial buildings to suck the heat out faster and also to expose the people to a cooling effect on their heads, which is not a bad thing. Um, and there's, there's a lot of these in Europe, and one of the CBE efforts is uh, to try to encourage uh, U.S. people to look at this, this technology and put them into buildings. And one of the really uh, first examples of it, um, and prominent examples of it, is this Brower Center that's on Oxford Street uh, by Kittredge. Um, that's a, that building has exposed concrete slab floors with uh, water tubing running through it, like, um, and, um, and um, that's the, the main uh, way that heat is extracted from the building. You can use rather warm temperature water to, to successfully cool the space. Air movement, however, is, is, is a bigger, the biggest problem. It, it's, until recently, it's pretty much been regarded as a draft. If you have any air movement at all, it's unacceptable to the engineer in a building. Uh, and there, the ASHRAE standards codified that. Um, and, um, and it was never really regarded as a positive factor for comfort except in kind of extreme cases like warehouses or, or farm buildings, stuff like that. It's, it's um, kind of a low-class way to cool yourself. It is, however, very effective, and, and that's what I'm going to focus on. Um, it's, it's kind of complicated because you're now taking a, a system that's been engineered to be very still air and you're trying to stir it up somehow inside. Um, and, and how do you do it? How do you get it to where it needs to be? Um, also, uh, people are all, you're all sitting on something and um, there's an opportunity to uh, extract heat out of you or put it into you uh, through the seat. The automobile industry uh, takes advantage of it, but people in, in buildings don't because the seat would probably have to have some kind of electrical cord going to it or a, or a duct or a pipe or something. And that's kind of hard when you're, um, when you're uh, in, a, in an office type of situation. Um, 
that's, I, I think we have something we're going to suggest which could, if you have the appropriate batteries, run all day uh, without too much, because, because the power is very low. And I'll, I'll present that. Um, and then the other thing is the whole situation. All these uh, comfort studies are done in the steady state. So you sit there for three hours, and you've got your feet isolated from the floor, and, and you're all wearing the same clothes, and you're all college students. And, um, and that's all the comfort research. You know, go through the studies through, the, through time, and they're all the same people. So you don't have old people. You don't have these new huge people. Um, there's a lot of stuff that isn't, uh, that isn't known at this point. It's remarkable. So um, but to, to really make a big improvement, and you've heard all this stuff going to zero energy or getting an 80% reduction in CO2, which I would love to see happen, but it ain't going to happen if we don't address the interior environment that we're conditioning toward. There is no technology that can be so efficient or you can't insulate enough to do it by itself. You have to kind of start looking at what people really need and maybe deal with the people themselves. To condition the body itself requires very little energy. Um, it's, it's by doing it by doing the whole space is what takes energy. If you can let the space float, you can save a lot of energy. And float in terms of temperature up and down, and you keep the people comfortable by these other means. And also the people are, are dynamic, and, and this is the DR people have been the people who've really brought this out. They want to know how much can I let the building float when the electricity goes off in the afternoon? How, you know, how fast can it float up? And what's going to be acceptable? That's, it's brought that to a new um, uh, uh, level of focus that's been really uh, good for our profession. OK, so this is, this is where you're, I'm going to talk now about thermal environments. And so this is how you perceive the thermal environment. You have three types of sensors. You have a pain sensors, a cold sensors, a warm sensor, and then pain again. And um, here's a temperature going across. This is um, 68. This is 86. And you can see that the cold sensors are, have a bigger uh, signal than the warm sensors. And they signal at the colder temperature. Um, there's a strange effect where you feel cold when you're, when you're burning hot. Um, but that's, um, uh, that's not the main thing. We're, we're kind of in, in a more comfortable zone. These are skin temperatures. So this, this slide is an interesting one. So this, this shows uh, under static conditions and under dynamic conditions um, how these sensors work. And, and what you, you can see that the, the, the cold sensor has this kind of a, 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 a profile and the warm sensor has this kind of profile. But if you look at a, a, a time series here, so you're coming along at a cold temperature, you step up to a warmer temperature, and then you step back down again. What happens? It's interesting. So here, the, the warm sensor is reading a certain level. Cold sensor is, is, um, is higher because it's cold. And then um, you step up the temperature. The warm sensor sh shoots way up to here, and then it, over time, it settles down to something. The cold sensor drops out, doesn't signal for a while, and then it comes up because you've um, comes up to some low level that's appropriate to this. So this is an overshoot here that's happened in both cases. It's kind of went beyond where the step would have suggested it should have. Then you let the temperature drop, the, the cold sensor picks up, and this one goes down. These, um, these overshoots um, occur, um, well, they, they, have a, a, they, sh they tell you that the, the dynamic sense of uh, changes in your skin temperature are 10 times stronger than the, um, the static uh, impulses from these, uh, these neurons. So they're, um, uh, you get these, these powerful overshoots, which can be very can be taken advantage of in building system, uh, uh, as I think I will get to. The, um, the depth of the sensors is also kind of logical. The cold ones are closer to the surface than the warm ones because we have to keep ourselves from dying, and we're not going to really die from being too warm uh, at the surface. Um, it's, it's the cold that's more dangerous, so we're, we're, we're alert to that. Uh, so the signal is stronger. The depth is closer um, from the cold sensors. And then they're all distributed around your body. Uh, and there's, 
not very many warm ones. The warm ones are these round dots, and there are lots of cold ones. Um, and so they're on the forearm here in this case and some warm receptors. Notice the dates on these um, physiological studies. That's the latest data. Um, this, there are fields in this world, you know, I think you computer science guys <laughs> can't imagine, you know, the, 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 the static level of progress and some of these things. Um, okay, but so those are the sensors and how they react um, and where they are. Um, but then underlying them is actually a, a whole plumbing system that is, has its own, H, you know, its own uh, control system and, and um, regulatory uh, basis. So you've got blood vessels that um, you've got thermal mass, you know, and you've got a lot of water and stuff like that. Then you've got um, blood that flows and is controlled by a, an active feedback system in your <clears throat> hypothalamus. And um, the blood vessels are, are paired, the big ones are, so that they have a countercurrent effect. You've probably heard of that for ducks and geese, how they keep their feet um, functioning uh, in the wintertime. Um, we have those two. Um, and then we have all these, we have heat loss that isn't not only by uh, conduction and, co and convection, but also by evaporation. And then the evaporation goes, and the, 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 the heat transfer sensibly and by evaporation and con um, by latent means uh, goes through your clothing. So there are clothing models. We have a, the, the advanced comfort model that I mentioned uh, embodies these things. It's kind of a slide for it. But those are the elements that we are, uh, are, are dealing with. So if we were to cool a person down, um, the, 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 the extremities get vasoconstricted, the skin temperatures get cold, the, the, uh, the uh, cold sensors fire more, um, and your brain picks up uh, the meaning of it. Uh, on the warm side, um, you, you're, you have a regulatory system that lets the blood flow rapidly. A lot of it goes to the wrists and to the face um, uh, to cool you off. And um, there's also the sensors operate. So here you've got the dilated hands and the vasoconstricted hands uh, in the, and then the face. And the reason I kind of focus on these parts of the body are, well, one, they have the exposed parts. So uh, all of us, we got those parts exposed for us. But the other thing is they are actually the, more sen the, the ones that really do change their temperature the most and, uh, and, and o dictate our overall sensation of comfort. So in a cold environment, um, this is the overall uh, perception, and it matches what the foot and the hand, which are at the end of the extremities, um, feel. Notice that the head and so forth like that are not, af not affected in this cold environment. It's, it's these two kind of seem to could predict the overall. Um, in the warm environment, it's, it's quite different. The head and the face are the most important, and then the, the hand um, turns out to be the, the next most important, especially the wrists. So if you can condition those parts, we, we figured, uh, you could maybe control people altogether. And so we did, uh, uh, actually one of my colleagues here, Wei Chang, who's in white, in the, in the, she did this massive study, which is unique in the world, uh, where we um, had people in leotards with Velcro on spinnaker cloth um, over them, uh, being supplied with controlled air temperature. Um, and so the one body part, your back in this case, your head in this case, uh, of, um, all the 16 body parts were independently controlled um, while the, the, the core temperature, the overall state, was also uh, controlled and monitored by eating a radio pill, which radioed out the, your core temperature. And with that, uh, there's a complex model that integrates all the, the different body parts and the core and their relative importance that, that works both uh, for static and dynamic situations. And so far, it's open to uh, interest. And the, the one thing you get out of this, which you got to keep in mind, but I don't know, you know how we can implement this in buildings quite yet, but when you, it's part of the overshoot phenomenon. If you're in a, a neutral situation, the temperature goes up, you you have a kind of a maximum comfort level that is always, it's always just neutral, a little bit above neutral. You can see the people, uh, this one doesn't have it, yeah. But 
if you happen to be cold, and, and, and the question is how cold, um, and, and you were to warm yourself, the whole body or a part of your body, um, you will feel um, much better than neutral. You will get to a point of feeling very satisfied. It's the kind of feeling you have on the beach when you're sitting in the cold sun. I'm mean, sorry, <laughs> you're sitting in the cold wind on the beach. It's a fairly cool day, and the sun is beating on you. Or uh, there's, there's all sorts of other combinations um, that you can think of. These, these pleasant ratings are really high. So if you could condition, um, if you could have people that are in a, in a warm environment have a certain part of themselves be cooled and maybe transient or also on a steady state basis, you actually might get better votes from that kind of uh, environment than in a neutral environment. And that would be interesting because you're only conditioning small parts of the person. So we're going to focus on conditioning uh, body parts that have the most impact take advantage of the transient overshoot. Um, uh, for the building uh, system, how do you find out where the people are? Well, most of them are on the floor, I mean, at least standing on the floor or sitting. And they're in their workstations or, and they're in chairs. Uh, but occupancy sensing is a really tricky thing in buildings. It's, a lot of it is out there, a lot of it doesn't work too well. Um, if you, if you, as you localize it, it, it becomes easier, I think. And I think it's something that we uh, we'll all have to be, um, pay attention to. Find out where the people are so they can then condition where they are. People also, um, we don't have to do all this by uh, central control. People can actually do what they need. They, they can turn knobs, they can, uh, they can open windows, they can do all sorts of things that, that if they have the, the choice to do it. One of the things people don't like about a lot of the modern buildings is they have no access uh, to any kind of actuation that that controls the environment. All right. Um, and decentralized control uh, can be central, it can have something to do with the central HVAC system, or maybe we could just let it behave randomly and, and not screw up the overall operation of the building. So this is a, the system that we tested. We had, a, um, we had some air movement that was blown in front of the people's faces where the two jets collided it produced a, a radius, radial donut of outflowing air in their breathing zone, uh, which we measured. Um, we had a foot warmer, which is just a, um, a radiant light bulb with a reflector shining on the tops of their feet. We had this thing, which I'll show in a second. This is a palm warmer that's made of a conductive material that also cools the palm. And then we studied hundreds of people uh, and got their votes under different conditions. It's the palm warmer. But the palm warmer has a slit here, and there are little fans inside um, that blow the air. This is the palm warmer here. It comes out over the keyboard so that you can, in, in warm conditions, you cool your wrists um, through that air jet, and also by simple conduction to the aluminum. Because the aluminum at room temperature, even if it's 80 degrees, is, is quite a bit colder than your wrist temperature, and so you get air conditioning uh, automatically at a heated mouse and so forth. Okay, so these were, this was tested, um, and it, this is just to say that people were, with all sorts of different sizes of nozzles and flows, uh, people were um, uh, comfortable, except when you didn't have the air movement. And there's an interesting thing that's quite nice, is that when, t when you're in hot um, uh, environments with still air, you perceive the air quality to decrease. And you can see here that, that as people got to 25 degrees or 77 Fahrenheit, the, um, the, the perceived air quality began to drop off, um, or somewhere between those, those temperatures that dropped off. Um, and there's a, there are reasons for this. <laughs> um, people hadn't thought about very much. Um, but if you uh, apply the air movement, you end up basically um, uh, get, keeping the air quality statistically, there's no difference. There's a big difference between these two, but nothing between this and this. And so the, um, the air movement has a, a beneficial effect on perceived air quality. And this ties into a number of things, one of which is that they probably are having better air quality. And the reason is when you're sitting there, all of you are sitting there generating 100 watts, and you are producing a plume of rising air, 
which is containing your bioeffluents, including whatever the carpet cleaning stuff was near the floor, which is also being entrained, and it rises up and goes right past your nose and, and goes right up to the ceiling. And if you put a person out with a Dutch collar, which might have been the reason for the Dutch collars, we don't know, they don't smell that. It deflects the, the plume to the, to the shoulders. Um, and we found, in, in testing it, um, we, we, we didn't make the people too smelly. We, we actually gave them some kind of a smell source. But, they, uh, but the air movement um, did the same as the collar. It, it cut the, the perception of the, of the rising plume of the, of the air pollution. So um, it's, it's interesting because in any kind of warm buildings, uh, air quality seems to be a problem. People keep calling for more air movement. You wonder, well, why do they want more air movement? They, they feel it's too still. They're, they're wanting something that will disrupt the plume, which rises over it. And the plume is about, runs at about 0.3 meters a second, and you need about 0.3 meters a second of air movement, which is um, uh, very slow. It's, um, well, it's a foot per second, so it's something like this, um, to, to cut that plume and to blow it away from your nose. So anyway, from that study and from, from those studies, we decided to make up a system that would use minimum energy and would provide those benefits. It would cool the face. We, we forgot about the arms or the, the, the wrist cooling, which is okay, but it's not as powerful as the cooling of the face. And we wanted to warm the feet when it was cold. So we built um, a foot warmer and a fan and worked a lot on making sure they were very quiet which they are, they're almost, they're really quiet, and they're below six or eight feet uh, of a very uh, orderly jet, um, and they only use maximum of four watts, usually more on the order of one and a half watts uh, to provide this cooling in, in the facial region. Um, the foot warmers have uh, uh, light bulbs in there, they're, they're reflector light bulbs. They're very inefficient for lighting, very good for heating, actually. They just, they burn up electricity, but they put it where you want it. So this is a foot plate that has a switch under it. So when you put your feet in a foot warmer, it comes on. Uh, it turns off a certain length of time after you take your feet out. Um, and on average, if people are in 65 degrees a temperature, which is too cold for people in this kind of clothing, um, they will burn 30 watts to keep their feet warm. And then they will vote the same as if you were at 72 degrees in our experiments. So. Um, this is, this, these devices were designed. Um, we analyzed them um, in, on computer models about how much energy would they save, which I'll show you next. Uh, but there's one more thing I wanted to mention. We, they have in them, they're Arduino based, there's an Arduino in here, and they have a USB link that goes to the person's computer so that they download um, periodically in the date, um, once a day or um, to our database what the settings are and what temperatures people are using. So it becomes a research instrument. If we could get enough of them, send them all around the country to people's offices, we would be able to collect data that doesn't exist about how people would use air movement. Uh, I'll just go um, momentarily to show you the scale of the energy savings that would happen if you use systems that condition people um, like this. So you could let the temperature range spread and you can see here, uh, temperature range, this is 86 degrees Fahrenheit. If you could let the interior be 86, which might sound totally uh, terrible to you, but that's what the Japanese have been putting up with all summer. Um, and they have been adapting. They've been using a lot of fans um, because you can actually get pretty close, somewhere between 28 and 30, somewhere in the 82 degree region. This is 82, this is 84. Um, you... Um, you can be comfortable with air movement and vote the same as if you were not. Anyway, the savings are huge. This is 30% of, of HVAC energy savings um, if you could allow the dead band to, to float. So here's the existing dead band. This would be uh, the adaptive model said band, uh, dead band. Uh, if you added ceiling fans, you can push it out to here and radiant cooling or heating um, down here. And then with these personal environmental controls, if we could go this far, uh, you know, that would be our ideal. That was, we could go there. If people are happy with these things, um, that would be great. So here's us making the fans, and here are the foot warmers, and here are lots of different colors, and this is the one going to the chancellor with a cowl on it. 
And so they have been installed. Um, a bunch of them have been sent down to the Brower Center where people are uh, using them um, because there are people um, that, that because of gender differences, you're always going to have some people who are uncomfortable. And so they, they've actually asked for these things and gotten them. Here's some more versions of this thing that uh, you can imagine having the fan up there on a stalk so you can come have it above. Um, uh, other fans that we've been experimenting with, these are actually simulated images, um, uh, are, um, would, be, would not be ducted. But I'm not sure. They, they, would, they would actually be able to reach. Um, this kind of a, a ceiling is interesting. That ceiling and this one are interesting because they, um, um, they're, they're, they're um, broken up. And um, the sound, the, the acoustical ceilings, and the sound can be absorbed on both the top and the bottom of them, so twice as efficient as the kind of ceiling that you have in a, in a normal suspended ceiling. These are, these are also capable of absorbing more energy. Um, so the um, uh, putting the fans into a ceiling of that sort is, um, uh, is one of the, uh, our next projects in our chamber. So here's where the people will sit. Overhead, you can see a... Uh, a fan, and it's one of these Dyson inductive ring fans. It blows compressed air through a slit on the inside of a ring, so the whole thing produces a, a big air jet. We got it here, and and the, um, the the thing with fans in the ceiling is that they don't give you a uniform distribution. Ceiling fans, uh, and, and and even jets like this would give you this kind of distribution. So what we are uh, looking at is to use. Um, get this right. Now I've got to get back. Next phase. Nope. Oh, there we go. There we go. All right. So this thing, this, this thing has a rotating thing, so it sweeps this rather large area. So it means you're not being cooled all the time, but you're being cooled uh, transiently um, in a, under a situation where your, your sensors are much more uh, receptive than under the steady state conditions. So as I mentioned, the... The, 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 the transient response is 10 times more sensitive than the uh, steady state one. So the, um, um, that's what we're pushing for. There are some things about building furniture this way. This is the touch desk where you put your hands out and you get uh, cooled off. There's other ones that people have played with. A very important one that I mentioned before is, this, is the, um, the seat. Um, we found that if you use the equivalent of an Aeron chair, which is a high-end chair, people like these, but if you put a reflective foil, or insulated, uh, this is double uh, with reflector on both sides, if you were to hang a reflective foil on the back side of it and create a void between the Aeron fabric and the, and, the, um, and the foil, and then you just run the four-watt muffin fan again, just stir up the air on the back side of that air on chair. That will cool you tremendously. And so this is a thing we were proposing to the auto industry in there. They got prob they're working on it. Um, but it really could work in buildings because with autos, you know, it's easy to do anything. You can put a lot of power or, or air into a chair because they're always fixed. Um, in buildings, they're not. But if you're only running four watts, you can run all day for four watts with some kind of battery pack and then you can over recharge it at night. So if, uh, anyway, this is, this is I think, a, a really promising thing, and the guys will work on that. Okay, the very last things are, we've, um, I mentioned before that we've worked on the standards and the protocols. We are, um, I just wanted to show you what people have called for. This is part of that air quality thing, is that when people are in, um, office buildings, and then they're voting somewhere in the neutral range. 52% of them want more air movement. This is existing buildings in, in the, across the world. And then there's some people who don't want any change, but um, nobody wants less air movement. And um, the next one shows that of those people who said they were dissatisfied with the thermal environment, we asked them, well, why are you dissatisfied with the, the in environment? Is it unacceptable? And of the unacceptable ones, uh, why were they unacceptable? It's because um, 
they, they wanted more air movement, not because they wanted less. So that was enough to, to convince ASHRAE um, to make the change. This is the new comfort zone. These are, it's kind of hard to say because they've been stretched on different axes, but, but these are the old comfort zones, the one, the, the half clo and the one clo comfort zone. And this is the temperature increase that you can have as you apply air movement. And, some, and this is really uh, unusual. This, this is air movement that's out of the control of the occupant, this zone. Um, this is stuff that has to be personally controlled. Um, so this gives designers um, a whole um, palette of opportunities now that they have never really thought about before or had to deal with before. And um, so it's going to be an exciting time um, going forward. I'm right on time. Thank you, Ed. So, oh, Paul, you got a question ready? Yeah, quick. Uh, um, locally, um, I remember when we were building this building, you know, you tried to come in with a team to do a better job of the facade. That's what triggered me. And now we have these other, and we were too late to do anything, right? And, this, and this building isn't too bad. Okay. Yeah. But then, but then um, you know, you and a whole lump, bunch of people here have been working on this building. But I'm just curious, the two new buildings that are going on on Oxford now, the, the Helios building is just going up and the Le Caching Center yeah. is two-thirds done. Has the CBE work, and, which is phenomenal, and I think you should be congratulated, has it started to penetrate those newer buildings on campus? Uh, so, so I'll leave my question yeah. there. Yeah, my, the Helios building is uh, being done by um, or the consultants on the shading or and the facade were done, Susan Ubelodi, who's one of our CBE faculty. Um, and she has a, a private firm, and they, they do this kind of stuff. Um, and so they're doing that, and I was totally delighted to see the design. It looks really good. And um, the, the Ching Center, uh, I was involved in trying to make sure they had these operable shutters, which you can see from Oxford. So the faculty have cranks, and they can open shutters, and they're facing west. And so if, if they didn't have those shutters, they would close their shades and leave them down for life, which is what the way it looks on when you look at the, that other building on uh, Oxford and Hearst, that, that temporary building or whatever it is the, on the northwest side of the corner. That's the shades are all down. Um, that's, they, they, they're getting cooked inside by too much sun. Um, the Shing Center, unfortunately, then has a bunch of decorative trim that's outside the glass. They've gone to all the trouble to put the fittings on to hold all this, this trim, but it has absolutely no solar benefit. It doesn't re redirect light to the ceiling, which is one thing you want, and it doesn't block sun on the people inside. So they'll have to air condition heavily in that building. And also on the e east side, they didn't do any solar control at all on the, on the con courtyard side. So they got this wonderful, they have these, the west facade is treated really well and really happy, but then everything else, oh, jeez, why do they do that? <laughs> and they're one of our partners. <laughs> so anyway, maybe don't, don't spread this around. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. And almost unbelievable, 18 years ago, I started working at LBL, and uh, there was already an aging poster uh, on one of the walls from some experiments with uh, having people look much like yours, people sitting in front of specially prepared workstations from which uh, they're sitting at a desk and they had air was being provided through a few nozzles they could control, like coming out at their belly, and there's some at the back of the desk that they could point at themselves, you know, point around, and, and there were, you know, plots showing how much more comfortable people could be at different temperatures and different air flows. And that was, as I say, that, that poster was there when I got there 18 years ago. So it's this stuff, you are clearly making uh, progress on many different kinds of gizmos and, and ways of looking at the problem and so on. But, but I kind of wonder if that was already 20 years ago, it was known that these benefits existed, why isn't this stuff actually happening? Well, that probably was a Johnson Controls uh, personal environmental module system. And we, very, we, we did a lot of testing on them. We installed a, a whole office full of them in, at the Bank of America building, the data center. And then we had another one in, in San Ramon and we, where we had everything logged even. Um, uh, we found and published that 
in the data center, uh, they, uh, they had 100% satisfaction, something we've never seen in any of our survey buildings. Because yeah, there's always somebody who's too hot or too cold, but when they had these things, they were, they were happy, so very good. Uh, and then the other place they had, um, oh, we had wonderful effects, transient effects, where people would play basketball at lunch and come back and they'd run their fans for an hour, uh, which otherwise they would have been really you know, painful. So we published these types of things, but it was at a time, it was a kind of a crash in the industry, right around the mid-90s. Um, that's one thing. The Johnson Control System was much too expensive. It was thousands of dollars, and it um, uh, was inefficient. Uh, in terms of it, it, they wanted to duct fresh air, so they had to somehow get a duct to something. Uh, we're, we're dispensing with that. We're just saying that fresh air, alone, I mean, local air is probably, possibly good enough. If you want to duct it, that's another thing, but that, that shouldn't be part of every thermal control. Um, so they had to pay too much, and people just wouldn't do it. Um, but we were, we were right on that one. We were very pleased. In the, we have a lot of them in the lab still, if you want to have one. <laughs> Yeah, I was curious. I'm over here. Oh, Hi. sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so you talked a lot about temperature control, but I'm wondering uh, how air movement relates to humidity. And in sort of a tropical climate or a hot, humid climate, um, you know, do, does the band look smaller, or how, what, what are some strategies there? Yeah, well, the comfort zone has a shape. You might have seen it tapered a little bit at the top. That's because the humidity has an effect. It's, it's, a, it's a real effect. It's not as strong as some other effects. Um, and so, so, yeah, the band is lower. Air movement um, is, is um, actually more effective when the humidity is up. And people don't also perceive it uh, so much um, uh, as in a dry climate. It, it isn't quite as extreme. It feels soft. And I always, I always tell these people from Europe who have these strict standards that we are kind of dispensing with um, that they, you know, they go to Hawaii uh, in, willingly, and they they sit, they sit in conditions that are what they consider unacceptable. Um, and and so, um, it, it's a very pleasant sensation to have air movement in, uh, in in with humidity. So then the question is: Is there another? Are there any other problems with humidity? I mean, they. they Closet, it'll make your mold, your clothes moldy. You know, um, uh, is there other health effects, dust mites, all those things? So that's a whole complex thing that um, it, we studied also back in the '90s, um, which in, I would say, in summary, that it encouraged us that humidity is not such a big problem, below 80 percent, and it, going down is a different story. That's in for for really cold climates, but. It, uh, it, uh, the humidities, I really think, somewhere 75 to 80 percent is okay. Um, you may need to ventilate. You may need to have air movement in those closets um, because it keeps the uh, local condensation from happening. Um, and of course, it makes you feel good. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think you can do. You, people have done, and people are doing all over the world. <laughs> uh, they're, they're using air movement as a way of. Uh, being comfortable. Uh, we have to combine it, though, with air conditioning sometimes, and so maybe for sleeping or for a certain other, if there's too much noise outside or if there's too much dust coming in. You know, there, so, so combinations of these elements are, um, are going to be the future. Yeah, um, yeah yes, great talk. Thank you. Uh, I'm wondering about the business case and making it to skeptics. And one part of the business case, of course, is the energy savings that you can get while keeping perceived temperature or keeping thermal comfort the same, right? Enormous savings in energy. I'm wondering about the other part of the case where with advanced climate control, you can improve thermal comfort. And I'm wondering if anyone has done studies on worker productivity as a function of improved thermal comfort. Yeah, um, productivity is always the, the bottom line that people want to, want to see. Um, and the studies are always very unsatisfying because you know office work is complicated to, to do. So there are these lab studies where people have done arithmetic, Sudoku, that's what we do, text editing, all this kind of stuff. They do that, and usually you don't see a, a big effect. When if if when they get too hot or too cold, you'll see an effect. But with this air movement and stuff, you don't see any real effect. Um, 
they, there was a, a nice study, but a fl somewhat, um, uh, well, it, a study that wasn't fully comprehensive that was done on those PEM systems at, at an insurance company back in the, in the 80s, um, which showed that people were really productive. One, it's like an extra 1 or 2 percent productive over um, uh, not having those systems. Uh, which is probably believable, and it's probably when you have your salaries go up one or two percent, it's, that's the cost of the building. Um, so it's it's a huge uh, effect. But everybody dumped on these guys. Hey, that your study you can, I, that doesn't apply to my building. And anytime anybody does a productivity study, it, it always ends up being dissed by everybody else. Um, and I don't understand it, and we kind of stay clear of it ourselves for that reason because we don't really believe. You know, people sense that they're in an experiment or they sense something or they're, I don't know, there's all these different things that affect productivity. Okay, we have one more, time for one more question. But it will be, it will affect the business case if somebody comes up with convincing evidence. It's just been many, many years that uh, productivity kind of moves along. I think we're in safe ground with what I've been proposing. Yeah, very interesting talk. And uh, I just wonder, so uh, this uh, condition, the body part, but uh, when you do the experiment, is other part of the room or own condition? Oh, no, no, they're contro it's controlled at, at uh, a range of temperatures so that we can compare the, the, the body part thing to the overall. So, but uh, if one person sits there, they can sit 24, not 24 hours, <laughs> eight hours a day just sit there. But when they move to us, how Very do they... Very good question. Yeah. That's, that's perfect. We had to study also what happens if you go away from the conditioned place. How long can you go away and still feel comfortable? So we had them go away for 10 minutes and talk to each other, and, and they had to climb up and down on steps, the equivalent of going up and down a flight of stairs. And that was fine at 82 degrees in, one, in our experiment, 50% RH. Um, then we had them uh, go away from the, the, the cooling 15 minutes, and they had to climb five stories um, in the chamber, up and down the step. You know. And then they got hot, and they felt warm. And so then the question really is, how do they feel when they get back to their desk? And that's where this gigantic overshoot occurs and they're comfortable instantly. It's like as fast as we can survey them, uh, they will vote very well, they, higher than neutral. And so the, we may be able to take advantage of people you know, lapsing out of, they don't feel uncomfortable for a long time as they go away from the thing, but they come back, they feel really good. So it's a, anyway, that's, I think it's something that we need to work on more, but I think we can take advantage of this. It's a sawtooth thing. It's a cheating. You know, you, you, you can keep them in the unpleasant environment longer, and they don't know it, that they're, that they're, that they're too hot they, because they keep getting feeling really good <laughs> when they get restored to, to comfort. Okay. And, and the Chinese and, um, uh, this and, and um, some years ago already, Japanese have studied various things having to do with the frequency of the air movement, the recurring interval of, of, of these fans and things. And, and there's, there's quite a bit of promise in that, I would say, in general, you know, that we can use these types of devices. Okay, I'd like to thank Ed for a wonderful talk.